Welcome to the Analytics Engineering Podcast, featuring conversations with practitioners inventing the future of analytics engineering. On this episode, we hear from Devaris Brown, the CEO and co-founder of Moroxa. Moroxa is a startup that helps teams build real-time data pipelines. Before Moroxa, Devaris held product leadership roles at Twitter, Heroku, Zendesk, and more. This was a fun episode because Tafaris has a larger-than-life personality, and he brings lots of energy and storytelling to his work. On this episode, we go deep on real-time data pipelines. We talk about the open-source technologies Kafka and Debezium that help with streaming and change data capture. We try to answer how real-time data should be used in analytics, and we describe how analytics engineers can play a role in building production apps that are powered by logic written in SQL. Tristan, what did you enjoy most about our conversation with Devaris? First of all, what did I enjoy most? I just enjoyed hanging out with Devaris. You'll see as we get into this episode, he's just like such a pleasure to spend time with. And we could have spent many hours talking to him about many different things. The place I was going to go to is that he spent years, most of his career, I think, in the streaming world. And all of my career really has been spent in batch world. And that's where most of us in data analyst land live. And so a lot of the questions that I asked him through this episode were me like trying to reach across this gap and feel like, what does it feel like to live on the other part of this? And and when are we data analysts going to get invited to this party? And often his answers I heard as it's ready for you, you know, come join the streaming party. And and so I'm excited to get in there myself and I'd love to use Maraxa internally. I'd love to start playing around in this version of the world. And I will, at that point in time, find myself much more opinionated about what parts of it work really well and what parts don't. But right now, I feel like he's trying to help me understand this world that I don't yet live in. Yeah, I think people don't talk about it enough, but Batch is great for most use cases. And it's really that analytical workflow that that we power at DBT. And there's this like streaming use case, which is enabling net new kinds of capabilities that are feel more like production use cases that get to be owned by the data team, which is, you know, historically not owned by the data team, it'll be owned by like software development team. So it's cool to see these two worlds kind of blur and how Maroxa makes hard things easier. And so I really enjoyed this episode. And without further ado, let's get into it. Tavares, thanks for joining us. Hey, hey, how you doing? Doing good. So I want to start, before we get into the, the fun stuff, I want to learn, learn a little bit more about you. You have a long career at this point. You've done a lot of stuff. And people would recognize the names of a lot of the, the companies you've worked at. Uh, little companies like Microsoft, Twitter, Zendesk, Heroku, and, and, and like some other stuff sprinkled in there too. Like when you tell yourself the story of your career, what's the story you tell yourself? Like what, what fascinates you? I think for me is is always been well. First of all, thank you for having me. But you know, I think I think for me the the most fascinating thing about my story is that I've always, regardless of where I've been at, I've always brought my authentic self and personality to the company. Right, even though I've always been focused on you know de- developer tools and platforms and all that type of stuff. Right, like I'm still the photographer. I'm still the DJ. I'm still uh, you know, do all these things. Right. And like, it brings that element of culture to, you know, uh, some of these companies. Right. So I've heard that Microsoft is, is famous for bring your full self to work. Is that, is that- uh, well, back in the two thousands, <laughs> that was not, the case. <laughs> you had to be very, very color inside those lines. Right. Yeah. I was a different time under Satya. I'm, I'm sure that's changed, but like, uh, I was just talking to one of my ex colleagues, Xendesk and, when I was there, I designed these T-shirts that were like for a hackathon and they had pulled it out because they were like, dude, this is literally the best T-shirt that I own. Right. Like it's cool. People stop me and ask about it all the time. And it was just like a random hackathon shirt. Right. And so for me, it's just one of those things where it's just like, you know, I realized earlier on that if I'm going to spend a third of my, my my life at a place, right, like, you know, eight hours out of a 24 hour day. I got to be myself and have some fun. And I think that that's really the the thing that has been the most fascinating outside of like the work thing, like, you know, cool shit about the, sorry, cool thing about the work part uh, is that, uh, you know, I've done some pretty interesting things that have been kind of behind the scenes. Right. Um, But then like, I started seeing like 
patterns develop across the industry, you know? So at some point, uh, uh, I, it, people use the Devar stack. So if you if you built anything on Zendesk, if you built anything on Heroku, surprise, surprise. And then I have all these like <laughs> like cousins, right? Like Netlify and you know all this other you know product managers that have worked under me and like all this other stuff go to all these places and do amazing things. But it's all been kind of like from this from this 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 perspective of you know empower people to be be successful, especially if they're engineers, right? So you get a lot of got to make a lot of decisions and choices, like how to operate software should not be one of those things. So I, I need to know, do they have DJ CEO meetups where you and David Solomon, CEO of Goldman Sachs meet up and DJ? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. You know what? That would be that would be amazing. Uh, we should have a a DJ battle off. I think I would do OK in that. I would love to see that. Yeah. So I was going to drill in on the, on the DJ thing, too. It, it is funny because. Lots of your work is very far away from humans, like the users. You're you're building the back office systems of the back office systems, and you are like a I don't know you and I don't know each other super well, but like you're a pretty uh, larger than life guy. Like you you have a big personality. You like lead with your personality. I can really imagine you in that space of like being a DJ, like getting a crowd hyped, all of that. But like, how do those two things come together in one human being? I think it is about. This, it, the similar aspect is control, right? And curated experience. So if you think about it, what a platform is, it's just technically just a curated experience to help people get from one place to the next in the most efficient manner, right? And then it enables all of these other individualized experiences. So if you think about a nightclub DJ, right? Or a club DJ or, you know, DJ anywhere, I'm giving you a curated experience to help you have whatever type of night that you want to have, right? And so I can dictate that based off of my selections. Just like a platform, mm. I can dictate your experience based off of my product decisions that I've made, right? Like, you know, am I going to go on-prem versus cloud, right? Like that's a conscientious decision that I am directing towards a particular group of people so they can have, you know, get to their happy path. Am I going to play Beyonce at 12 o'clock or Young <laughs> Thug, right? Like, you know, like, like it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, I have to understand the audience. I have to understand what they're trying to do. Like, I can't play certain types of music at certain times for certain audiences because it might not resonate. So I have to, I think the two are very, very linked. And that's it's so interesting, DJing as, as product management. I love that. Yeah. The other thing that you were speaking to before in the your answer to my earlier question was this, like, love of coaching of developing people. And that's a thing that it sounds like you've done a lot in your day job, but you also do a lot of other stuff in this area. Mentorship, General Assembly, Floodgate, VFA, like you, you do a lot of this. Connect that dot. What, what's what's going on there? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think for me, uh, there aren't a lot of folks that look like me at the, in the places that, that uh, in positions that can hire and fire. Right. And so uh, if you look at a lot of these blog posts on Medium or TechCrunch about how to get a job in tech, how to become a product manager, blah, 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 they come from a very, uh, uh, you know, kind of majority perspective, right? Like my experience is getting a, a, a product lead or a product management position as a black man is just different from, you know, everybody else, right? And so I can only speak to that experience or even as an engineer, right? And so the bits and bytes are one thing, but then like, that you have to deal with the other side of it, right? Which is like how to acclimate to a culture and a climate that you're just honestly not not used to, right? And so it's not necessarily about assimilation, but it's how to again how to bring your authentic self and 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 to maximize your your you know your relationships and your ex, you know your career inside of these corporate entities that by and large have done everything that they can to keep you out for the longest of times right yeah and so you know you see people like me and some of my colleagues that have by and large made it right and like we're able to dictate you know resourcing and things like that like why not just tell people in mass like yo this is one way that you can build generational wealth like i wouldn't be sitting here if i wasn't an early employee as Indus that ipo I'm just being honest, right? Like that didn't, that gave me enough money to just chill for a little bit, right? And and take some take some risk. But you know, over overnight, you know, I got a few million bucks uh, in my bank account because I was just right place, right time, you know. And it's like I had a a college homie of mine who partied harder than I did, 
uh, was a customer service rep at Google for like at, in like 2004, right? Has eight figures or more in the bank and like now is a thought leader, right? And I'm like, dude, you literally know, <laughs> know nothing, but right place, <laughs> right time, um, you know? Harsh. <laughs> I mean, he, it, you know, it, it's kind of funny now. This is like, word, yeah, you're, 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 you're anyway. but, but it's like, look, if, if you're, if you, if you get involved in this industry, it's life changing, right? Like, you know, you think about, when I came out of college, I tell these kids this all the time. Like when I came out of college, I was making more money than my parents had ever made. Right. Like it was, you know, six figures plus. So why wouldn't you want that? And I've been doing this for 20 years. So you know, you can do the math, right? Like it's, it, you know, it's a lucrative thing. So just put the time in just like anything else. Um, and so for me, it's, it's super important that I give back because I had people do that for me. Right. And, um, it's incumbent upon people that are successful, especially in the underrepresented, underserved cultures to, you know, kind of lift as you climb. And I think that that's something that's super important. Oh my gosh. That's, it's like such a big topic and it's near and dear to my heart. One of our values is we are human. And so writing that word down on a readme file in a GitHub repo doesn't make it true, but you know, we've got to try to make that true every day. I would disagree. I would disagree, man. Like, yeah, I, I would say the writing it down in a readme file shows intentionality. It's not nothing. I 100%. I agree with you. Right. And intentionality is the the seed that starts a lot of these things, right? And like if if people start seeing it a bunch of places, then they're going to say, "Yo, what do you actually mean by that?" And then like yep. You can talk about the things, right? And like those things don't go unnoticed. And and you know, you're the you're the head of an organization, you're the head of a movement. And if this is your philosophy, <laughs> right? I mean, let's be real, man. Like DBT is like one of those stalwart technologies now, right? Like, you know, and so so if you're the head of this technical uh, uh product and and company and you believe that we are we are human, that's gonna have some people self select into that, right? Um, and I think that's super important. I appreciate it. Because we would be in danger of like spending literally the entire hour on this topic if I just kept asking you questions about it. If folks feel interested in this thing, do you have a blog? Do you, is that like a place that people can go to engage more on the like things that you think in this topic? Or have you all done it like one-on-one -on -one level mentorship? I'm terrible at this. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm better at like one-to-one, one-to-a-few. I got to get my like one-to-many uh, uh, voice and posture uh, solidified. So that's like <laughs> on enough. my OKRs, like personal OKRs, <laughs> you know, but I'm on Twitter, you know, DeVars P Brown, come holler at me at the DBT slack. You know, I'm at DeVars Brown there. If you want to talk about this stuff. So, yeah, this is like the worst transition in the history of all transitions, but should we go from there to talking about real time streaming pipelines? Is that oh, I think this is a great transition. <laughs> and now back to our regularly scheduled programming <laughs> yeah, on hey. data and analytics. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah, let's get into it. Although, I think I think Tristan's right, we probably could do a full episode about learning more about Devaris the human, but I digress. Let's actually get into it. So, we're gonna talk a ton about streaming and real time data. Yep. I like to make sure everyone's kind of has the same background when we dive into these topics, make sure that we're all coming from the same place of understanding. So we're going to talk about a couple of jargon words, CDC, change data capture. What are these things actually mean and why is it getting a lot of attention today? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm old enough uh, to have experienced the first dot com crash, right? Like I've been in this thing for probably 25 years now, and I just remember doing database backups. All right, that, this this is where we started off at, right? Like back up your database to a tape or, you know, zip or whatever it is, right? And, you know, if disaster strikes, you pull out the tape and you replay all of those transactions. 90% of the time that stuff failed, right? <laughs> like, and funny enough, even with all the technology that we have now, a lot of people are just like one misconfigured field away from, uh, you know, having their their data be lost for a very long time. So one of the strategies that you can use instead of taking like running this job every hour on the hour to back up my database from a particular ID on forward, right? Uh, I can literally keep track of every transaction that hits a database in a, uh, uh, you know, on, on, on a, on a like real time stream, right? And this is what's called change data capture, right? So every time, a transaction hits a database, it gets recorded into a log file, right? 
uh, you, you can basically read that log file and then just like every with every transaction and then replay the that transaction into another destination right like into a backup destination to a you know data warehouse or any of that type of stuff you're literally just capturing every transaction as it happens versus waiting every hour to get uh you know select all from orders right uh where id is equal to this right you know kind of thing the good thing about that the uh, the benefits of change data capture is that it gives you more granularity so when I write a SQL query, right, like I'm getting the end result. With change data capture, I'm getting all of the little things that happen in between. So if I'm an e-commerce store, right, uh, I can select all from orders, uh, you know, and join on users to see what users ordered things, all right? And that gives me a good, you know, history of like, okay, well, what are my what are my transactions for the day, right? I can write reports on that. But what if I want to do uh, uh, cart retention or, or, you know, reclamation, right? I want to know who actually has like added things to a cart, but actually hasn't completed a purchase. What would I do at that point? I can go get a vendor or I can actually just use the database that I have because every transaction is getting from user added something to cart. There's a timestamp there, right? Um, user uh, check out, right? Like there's a thing, user updated inventory, user did all these things, user changed address, right? Like you can capture all these things in between and then get the purchase, right? And then once you do that, then you can like just write a SQL query that says, hey, I wanna know all the people who have added something to a cart but actually haven't completed a purchase with this particular session ID. And you don't have to go spend six figures on the vendor to tell you that, right? Like you can just do that yourself. So those are the types of things that you can get with change data capture versus writing these like big batch jobs that move data from one place to the next that are very prone to fail. That's a lot of helpful context on the, the real world use cases for why it matters. And it's not just the start and finish state that people need to capture. It's the journey along to start and finish that helps that change data capture helps you see more visibility into. Oh, absolutely. And, and think about the nuance of what I've said, right? Like people just think about change data captures like, yo, I get the change and I have to act on the event like right then and there. What I said was, is like, nah, you just capture the data and put it into a place where you just have the, the granularity of that real time data, but you have it at the, the, like the interval of what you need. So it's easy to go from real time to batch, but you can't go from, you can't just speed up batch to make it faster, right? Like that's low latency, not real time. Got it. And so there's new technologies that have come out that help companies do this, some open source. Debezium seems to be the platform for change data capture. Help explain a little bit about Debezium. Like, how does that maybe fit in with streaming? Are they married well together, like Kafka plus Debezium? What's the larger picture there? Yeah, shout out to Gunner over there uh, at uh, uh, that runs the heads up the, the Debezium project uh, over at Red Hat. Like, super nice person. But yeah, Debezium is one of those foundational technologies. Like, we've been using it since the Heroku days. Like, so me and my co founder, we came from Heroku. We just think that. Like, look, it makes it very easy to, 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 to connect to a source. Yes, you have to run the Debezium service, right? Like it's an open source project. You have to run it, you know, and all that. But it makes it very easy to connect to a source. And if change data capture is available, right? Like it, it allows you to just connect to it and then um, turn your tables into Kafka topics, essentially, right? Um, and it's... It, it, it's I shouldn't say super easy because it's, it's pretty difficult to to actually operate and things like that. Um, and, you know, shameless plug, Moroxa makes it very easy for you to do those things. But at the end of the day, right, like Debezium just, just literally turns your your tables into Kafka topics um, or streaming topics, right? You can put it in, you know, change the, 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 the streaming uh, provider in between. But um, yeah, I mean, like that's the, 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 the de facto open source thing, like there's commercial things out there and they largely all do the same thing, right? Which is they listen to your log files for a bunch of different destinations. They have established patterns on how they get data out of a data source. And then they turn that into a, uh, you know, kind of a, a stream of data that you can distribute to, to, you know, a bunch of different destinations. Got it. So when I hear Red Hat, so they're the main maintainers. I hear, I think of big, large enterprise, maybe complex to actually get up and running, but certainly useful for people who have lots of data or 
particularly difficult volumes that they have to handle with incremental changes. What does the rest of the world do to solve your problem that seems like pretty universal? What happened in a shopping cart? Someone tried to place an order but didn't finish the transaction. What does the rest of the world do? What a tee up. So this is, is there like, a company know, that this, you know of? <laughs> I feel I feel like like Help. <laughs> you know I feel like this was yeah I mean look obviously you know shameless plug again at Maroxa we do that right so this was born out of us seeing large enterprises with unlimited resources even struggle with this right um, because at the end of the day to get Dubizium running how you need it to. There, there's a lot of just like tribal knowledge that that happens. So the benefit that we had in Maroxa was that like, look, we built a platform. So use cases are not standard, right? Um, and so we've seen a little, a lot of the edge cases that ended up happening. And so with Maroxa, literally, it's it's. I mean, underneath the hood, it's it's Debezium with some extra stuff that we've done, uh, Kafka, a schema registry, uh, and Kafka Connect, right? So we just make it easy for people to. You know, ingest data, stream it to destinations and transform in between. All right. Because we just think that like that's just a good developer experience, right? <laughs> like you don't need to know how the data's getting out of it. You just need to know that it's gonna be real time, right? And you, you have guarantees around what that the shape of the data is gonna look like, right? Um, and I think that's really all people care about. They don't care about the the they sh- shouldn't care about like how the sausage is made right like it's just like as a data engineer really what all all jobs that i have is to know where my data is coming from know where my data is going and what format it needs to be in when it gets there right i would use a company such as dbt to do the formatting part but maroxa can do the you know where my data is coming from and where my data is going part right like we do that very very well can you talk a little bit about where it's going a lot of our universe the dbt universe like the data stores of record are warehouses or lakes. Yep. You certainly can capture full fidelity change data capture in those sources. And like you were talking about at the beginning, you 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 can do SQL based diffs on these things. A lot of times folks use CDC based streaming to get low latency, but then they actually flatten it right back out to just like a user's table without any diffs in there. Do you see the right place for a stream like this to end up to be in a warehouse or or should it be in a different format, different kind of technology? Honestly, I don't think it should matter, right? Like here, here's the thing, right? Like everybody has different use cases and, 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 and patterns, right? And so the answer is why not everything? The thing is, is that like the tooling around the real time ecosystem has just been so bad that people have just said, you know what? All I care about is just getting into a data warehouse and I'll figure out how to do it from there, right? Uh, which is perfectly fine. But then you inject, you know, uh, companies like us and some of the other folks that are, are more worried about like the quality of the data in the stream before it actually reaches that destination, then it makes your life a lot, lot easier, right? And so if you think about like, all right, the, the actual term data lake and data warehouse and, you know, uh, whatever else you want to call it, right? Uh, Lake house and all this other stuff, right? Like the data lake is just, 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 just things that are data mart, right? Like the data lake is just, just raw data, raw stream that just falls into there. Right. It's perfectly fine. The data warehouse should have a little bit more, uh, you know, kind of organization before it gets there. Right. Like I'm being choosy about what information gets there because I'm using it for a specific purpose, usually analytics, right? Like that's usually what people use it for. Data lakes can be anything at this point for data mart, right? Like the reason why people are using that is because they need to pre-aggregate a table to use it for mostly operational purposes, right? But it seems like there's a little bit of an impedance mismatch between a warehouse and a lake, which come from, at least my belief, they come from batch-based origins, regardless of how they may want to be moving into a more real-timey world. They come from batch-based origins, but then there's like this different class of data stores, whether you want to talk about materialize or rock set or like these data stores have kind of different properties. Do you find that your users have an affinity for these different types of data stores? Oh, absolutely. But it just depends on the team and the use case. Right. Mm. So, so, uh, you know, again, shout out to Arjun over at materialize. They're doing great. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I think, I think, you know, we've talked about this 
before, right? It's like, if I want to build a real-time data application, right? Like, just think about the end state, right? I'm a hospitality company that that wants to, to, to every time somebody checks into a hotel, I want to give them some personalized offers. I could wait for my ML models to recompute and do all this other stuff, right? Or I can build an active learning pipeline based off of, of materialize, right? Like, and, and you know, kind of kick off these workflows where I'm able to query data because now I have this real time data in the moment that gives me more broader context. Right? Like, I don't think the, the, the issue is, is like, yes, people want to do both things, but most of the tooling is focused around like commercial tooling is focused around analytics. Right. And that's usually a kind of a batch based thing, right? Like I can look back 24 hours to figure out what happened versus no, I want to know, when this thing happens so i can react to it exactly in a moment there's actually a mismatch between the technology what people are offering and then customer expectations right and i think the companies like materialize and you know all the flink and druid and all those like kind of real-time uh, data store and analytics kind of companies right like they haven't really leaned into the use cases because I think the tooling has been kind of bad. It's hard to get data in. It's hard to like run these automated processes to like provide experiences. But like customers want to know, yo, what's relevant to me right now, right? Like um, when, when I was doing the seed round and, and everything, like we were talking to a large hospitality company, right? And basically we did a, a like a design partnership with them. And the, the crazy part was, is like, they, they really want to do like, as soon as you check in, we're going to give you an offer. Right. But their, their processes around this batch thing sometimes would take a couple minutes. Sometimes would take a couple days. So you think about a weekend in Vegas, right? Get there on a the Friday. Most of the time leave on a Sunday, depending on how well I do on Saturday. Right. Uh, Friday night and Saturday, but most of the time leave on a Sunday like 80% of the time their batch job failed so they couldn't recompute their models. So by the time that the person left on Sunday, that's when they were getting the offers, All right? So just by just by switching to, you know, using us with the, you know, a, a, a real-time data store, right? They were able to like, you know, for their, their, their you know, whale customers, right? They were able to, to, to increase conversion over 20% just by, switching technologies right which resulted in eight figures worth of revenue right like that's the type of stuff you you know product managers have to think about uh these technical folks have to think about because customers want these experiences right just imagine if you log into netflix and like it took you two days to get like things you should watch right you might have missed squid games you know <laughs> like that's the thing <laughs> So I think you're describing something really fascinating to me that I've also been like mulling over in my head for a while. And let's see if I can actually describe this interesting change I'm seeing in the industry, which is like Kafka or streaming real time. That used to be software developers for production applications. And I'm using the word application like you need to have a very responsive, reactive app. Yep. Not at all the data person. But now, if you know SQL, there are all this tooling that's coming out that lets people who know SQL actually build applications that are responsive, reactive, and can do similar things to software developers in their suite of tools. Yep. So one of the things I'm super fascinated by is like this low code idea of, you know, SQL. Well, that's like a superpower now because yep. we have all these great tools with real time sync, real time response. You can build an app. Do you see that shift happening? Does that resonate with you? Like, who are the Maroxa power users? Is it to be, I know we have a lot of different names for the humans that use these tools, but is it more the analyst? I'm going to use extremes analyst or software developer. Yeah, for 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 us, it's, it's been the analyst, data scientist, like that type of person, because it's just super easy for them to like, again, if I'm a data engineer, I want to do the data engineering job. Where's it coming from? Where's it going? What format does it need to be when it gets there? Right. Uh, and we built our platform around that. Right. And so if I am an analyst, I can just, as long as I have credentials, I can just log in and drag and drop and boom, I'm done. Right. Or I can, you know, go in my CLI and just say Maroxa connect Postgres to Snowflake and I'm done. Right. Um, and if you don't believe me, it literally is a 30 second video that we have. It's just super easy for us to do those things. Right. But the interesting thing is, and I don't know when this is going to air, but like, let's just say it airs very soon. 
like the thing that we've come up with is like we realize a lot of these commercial tools are focused towards that audience but like the engineers are still trying to figure out like yeah i might have wrote all these scripts or all this thing to kind of help reason about this very high code environment but there's really nothing that speaks to them from a low code perspective so one of the things that uh spoil alert that marox is working on and this is nobody really knows yet but uh, i will give you all this <laughs> heard exclusive. it here first yeah. you heard it here first when they go low we go high cope that is uh so we are <laughs> we are building shout out to michelle obama uh but we are uh uh developing a maroxa sdk and that will give you the ability to uh, uh build and interact with data pipelines via code because everybody's doing the low code thing right like I mean, I can name 50 different tools right now that are like drag and drop and, you know, connect pipelines and things like that. But I think this is kind of table stakes, right? And, and you know, from a business perspective, um, everybody kind of says the same thing. Oh, we hope you build pipelines in minutes, not months, right? Like, you know, and it gets kind of boring, right? It's like, you know, I'm a big Ocean's 11 fan or Ocean Series fan. It's like, you know, you don't do the same gag. You got to do the next thing, right? Like, has to be an improvement. So uh, the Marox SDK is kind of like that thing, right? Where... Yes, we can help analysts and data scientists, you know, build uh, build real time pipelines to help them do their jobs better for, you know, uh, data analysis and building models and things like that. But engineers kind of need help, too. Um, and if I can build a pipeline that can uh, ingest data, transform and distribute data with idiomatic code, I think that's actually pretty cool. Um, and then I can write my own SQL and do all this other stuff inside of that code. Right. Like I think that's kind of cool. Because there's more people that know SQL than it is people that know Python, right? Like, the thing I always tell, tell folks is like, look, if you're going to do enterprise software, your biggest competitor is Excel. Excel in, in, in a regular database, SQL database. There are more people that understand that and can reason about that than can write scripts in Python, Ruby, JavaScript, and all the other stuff, right? Um, so you got you to gotta be able to, to, to be flexible and, and kind of serve those audiences. I mean, our whole thing is, is like, look, people towards the edge, the people who are actually consuming this data, they need to be empowered. The The pipes, you know, that, that should just be table stakes. So like, let's build experiences that enable this like decentralized execution because they're closer to the problem, right? And they and, and they know how to use the data. The problem is like the data hasn't always been in, available to them in a consistent format, right? And that's what, you know, the foundation that we've built. So you've described something incredibly powerful and I'm wondering, every single transaction gets recorded. That's a lot, a lot of data, right? Like anytime you do anything, you probably have like five artifacts of the main thing that you do. Are there limitations to like, suppose you have a very fast changing data set. Can you use something like CDC or Roxa to get the answers you need? Or are there kind of points where it taps out? Like we don't do time series because, hey, that'd be crazy. No. No. I'm, get, I'm getting a, a so, no. <laughs> <laughs> we do hundreds of millions of requests a minute on a pretty beefy box, but basically a single box. And if we get beyond that, then we can automatically scale. I mean, this is one of the benefits of us running a platform like Heroku and building on that. It's like, we've seen this, been there, done that. Like we would do billions of requests a second at Heroku, right? Like, and, you know, my co-founder and a couple of members of my team, like we were the, you know, they were the architects of that. Right. And so that's the, the, the beautiful part is like having that previous experience that helped us kind of build this platform today. Right. And so, um, yes, there are limits to, you know, like the laws of physics that we have to abide by. Like we're not, we're not violating anything or anything like that, but like, we built a, a pretty good system that can automatically handle the, the the traffic wherever it comes from and maintain performance. So I think that's one of the, again, like that's not stuff that y'all need, you know, people who are building these apps or doing these analysis and all this, that's not stuff that you need to worry about. All you care about, yo, where's my data coming from and where's it going? And what format does it need to be when it gets there? That's the higher level value that, that you as a human can provide. You need to focus on th that part, not the, how the sausage is made right i think i think one of the, the the best marketing jobs in the history of technology is kubernetes why because people actually care about how the sausage is made if they choose kubernetes right it is not a great developer experience if you've ever had to like set up a kubernetes cluster right like i you know i invest in startups and like 
my pre-seed startups are worried about hiring a DevOps engineer uh, before they even have product market fit because Google has said Kubernetes is a thing, right? Like you don't need to know all that stuff. And and like as a data engineer, why do you need to know how to set up a Kubernetes cluster to run all these things and Docker compose and blah, blah, blah. Like, again, where's my data coming from? Where's it going? What format does it need to be when it gets it? Like if we can get to that point, then it's like we can start saying better experiences, better apps, you know, better analyses, like all this type of stuff. And that's really as a as a as a culture and an organization, like that's the the North Star we need to to aspire to. Not like being more technical, putting another tool on the stack that somebody has to learn in order for them to be marketable and productive. Hey everyone. Just dropping in to let you know that the annual Analytics Engineering Conference, Coalesce, is back. We had the first Coalesce last year in December, and it was fantastic. We had 3,000 registrants, tons of presentations, and this year is going to be even bigger. Register for free at coalesce.getdbt.com. I'm interested in the piece where you said, what format does it need to be when it gets there? So yes. transformation. Alley you back to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> can you do like, I mean, transformation can be an expensive operation, right? Do you do like simple, light transforms? Are you able to do more tightly coupled to business logic transformations? Talk to me about that. Yes. Uh, you talking about with Maroxa or just in general? Yeah, like streaming. I think it's interesting to think about transformations in batch for streaming. Yeah. Are there differences there? How do you think about like moving, changing data in motion versus when it arrives? Yeah. So the answer to your question is like, we can do both. So because we use Kafka underneath the hood, simple thing is to use single message transforms, right? Um, and basically the transform gets applied on every single event that comes across a particular Kafka topic, right? That's, that's table stakes for us, right? The thing that the thing that we realized was like, oh, there's some other types of transforms that we can allow people to do. Uh, so now you can write arbitrary bits of code, right? Uh, well, you will be able to once we release uh, the SDK, right? Like you can write arbitrary. It's just code at that point, right? So yeah, I can write business logic. I can bring in other libraries. I can do data augmentation and enrichment and all these things because it's it's literally just code, right? Um, uh, and so we do that on the fly. So every single event that comes across a particular pipeline, you just write a function that's like a uh, call clear bit, right? <laughs> right. Like you can have a user enrichment function. You can have a, uh, uh, you know, if I'm doing something that has location data, I can call Iggy, right? Like, uh, and, and, you know, use that stuff. Or if I just want to just dump it into a materialized database, and I can, you know, because now I can just say, hey, I want to just write regular, regular SQL. Uh, I can dump it and take this real time stream. Uh, Maroxa connect to, to, to materialize database. And I can write DBT on, on, on those things at, at any point in time, right? Like that's easy to do as well, right? So you can take a code first approach or you can take a more infrastructure, you know, traditional like SQL based approach streaming transformations breaks my brain a little bit. And I, I, I have just like some experience with this, but I don't go deep here. So this is more me asking you to educate me. Yeah. But when you do transformations in the warehouse, you don't have to really too much reason about the relative state of the different tables. You, they kind of have all been roughly loaded in a batch and they all have about the same freshness of data. And so you can do things like join orders to users and that kind of works. But my understanding is that when you're in stream, the scope that you have access to, if you want to like join across streams is rather limited. Is it? So this is not a question of like, this is a bad idea. You should, that's not what I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to understand like, how should people think about where this is good and where this is not as useful? The, specifically the transformation part. Late arriving data. That's like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a question of mine too. Yeah, yeah. So interestingly enough, you can actually join streams uh, in real time uh, on, on particular records huh. uh, or particular fields. Uh, and I actually, I'll send you a code sample from the SDK. Like it's actually kind of cool how we do this, right? Uh, 
And uh, so if I want to, if I have a, a orders table and I got a users table, like I have two separate streams and I can actually transform independently both of those streams, right? So I can write some some code to do that. Like, oh, I want to go to, 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 you know, this stream goes to, to GDPR compliant table. So I can like actually have like a GDPR function that, you know, takes out all the PII and all this other stuff, right? I can actually join those two separate streams on user ID, right? And then I can send that stream out to my data warehouse if I want to. And then I can, you know, do whatever it is I need to at that point. Um, as far as like like windowed aggregations and, you know, kind of like all that type of stuff. Um, yeah, we just include a, like a key value store uh, with that, huh. that, on, <laughs> that very simple key value store uh, that, that we use for, for a couple of different purposes. Right. And so some of that is for like replays and retries and like all that type of stuff. So, you know, we use Kafka under hood, so you're going to get at least once delivery, right? Mm. Uh, you know, there's going to be some duplications and all that, but that's just kind of table stakes for Kafka, right? But we try to do a lot of things behind the hood to make it feel a little bit more resilient so that you have a lot more confidence around doing these types of more complex interactions. Hmm. Maybe I'm the target audience for uh, this because when I've tried to reason about KSQL or like Spark streaming or things like this, I'm just like, Oh, this is like one level deeper than I want to be thinking about the problem. <laughs> right. So this is my thing, right? It's like the question I have for you, and I'm sorry, I'm going to turn this to a host. Yeah, right? yeah, like please. what compelled you to go think of to use Spark Streaming or try to use Spark Streaming or KSQL? Like what was that use case? And then why did you turn to that specific technology? To be very honest, my brain works. I didn't have a use case. I like okay. am always interested in like what are the bounds of the observable universe? Like how mm. far can somebody like me push how, what's what's my creative how big is my blank canvas and i actually was like let me see if i can do more real timey things and the answer and this was a couple of years ago but the answer then was like kind of not really unless i want to spend like more time than is reasonable thinking about things that didn't feel high value to me personally yeah and to be honest like that's the ethos of how we built our company it's like you shouldn't have to think about those things all you care about is like, yo, I just got this stream that I want to do some analyses on. Or I want to like poke around in it and I want to like repurpose it for multiple use cases. Right. So I want to do some like real time analytics. Maybe I can do like a real time dashboard or something like that. Right. Uh, or I want to do like active learning where I can like recompute models in real time just based off of, uh, you know, uh, the, the stream of data. Or, hey, I want to do some like, you know, turn my, uh, production app into a uh uh you know kind of event-based model right like you should be able to do those things and not have to like spend a lot of time worrying about all right case equal spark streaming do i need to set up a flint cluster do i need to do druid right now like all this stuff doesn't matter right like customers don't care what technology that you use underneath the hood they just want the experience and those customers could be internal or external right like you know, if, if I'm building dashboards and it's a real time dashboard, nobody cares that I use a particular technology. They just want the results. Right. Like, just give me the meal. Don't tell me how you, you know, what ingredients you used. All right. And so that's the thing where there's a misalignment and kind of a, a, a mis expectations between what the user wants and like engineer and analytic engineers expectations and their motivations. All right. And I just think like somebody has to win out at some point. Right. Because there's always been this tension between the end user and the customer versus like what people are trying to do behind the scenes. Do you, I need to recreate the wheel every single time? Like, yo, Tris, I'm like, yo, let's go on a road trip. Right. Do you want uh, a box of parts and no instructions? Or do you just want a car that's fully charged up? Because, you know, we're living in the climate control age. So we got to do electric cars these days. Right. Do you just want that thing fully charged up so we can just go? Right. Like, I, I'm pretty sure you want the latter versus the former. Right. And I feel like the former is what the data industry is today. You get a box of parts with incomplete in instructions that over time you'll 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 kind of fill in the gaps. But every single time it's just this, this adventure, right? Like <laughs> I hear Ben Stansel in the back of my head talking about the modern data experience. This is a theme. This is a theme. Yeah, me and Ben talk quite a bit about that, right? It's like this is kind of the state of the state right now. We got all these tools. Like we haven't the wild part is, is like I'm grateful to be included in all these like modern data stack posts, but like is most of these modern data stack posts are like built on 
the premise of batch which is honestly built mm -hmm. in the 60s right mm -hmm. so is that really modern Hep Ed, with all these tools <laughs> oh. i'm just saying oh. Oh. I, look i gotta be careful i gotta I'm be with careful you. with I'm the with batch you. crowd right like you know it takes a while <laughs> for them to get going but once they get going they're all coordinated right that was a joke <laughs> <laughs> i got that from uh brian leonard at group rule he told me that one time but i was just like look you know uh, it, it was you know me and ben talk about this all the time it's like we have all these tools and you know all these higher order abstractions and all this other stuff but like have people actually been more productive i don't know because like it seems like we just kicked the can down the down the line where it's like or even back further where it's like yeah we have all these things that can help us get going but like setting them up to orchestrate between them that's now the problem so i don't know it's just i don't think that we're we're, we're really at this modern part we're just kind of like a little more convenient not necessarily modern so i, I think you probably have alluded to it a lot in just what you've said, but I do this for all our guests to wrap. Looking 10 years out, what do you hope will be true in the data industry? I just think that in the data industry, I hope that we are at a point of consolidation, that some of these, and, and consolidation that, that has led to higher levels of productivity, where I don't think people have to make a, you know, have a flame war around batch or real time, it's just data, right? <laughs> Like, like I can, I, I literally can just hit a button and like, I just know exactly that the data that I want is going to be in the format that I need, uh, a, a, you know, at the granularity that I need, uh, for the provisions that I do have. And I'm just able to, you know, kind of multiplex that and distribute that out to whatever else that I need. All right. Like I just want the, the thing that I want the data industry to evolve to is like have more of a customer centric mindset, right? where I am able to deliver what my customers need versus scratch my own intellectual curiosity. If we can get past all of the, the medium posts and flame wars and all that type of stuff, right? Like, What are people like you and me going to do then? <laughs> well, I mean, we're, we're picks and shovels, right? Like, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. I like writing medium posts too. I don't, man. I, I can do this all day. You know, it's, it's that writing thing because it's like, you know, I just get mad, right? And it's like that one person in, in West Virginia that says something. I'm like, yo, what's your address? Uh, uh, let's have a conversation in person. But no, I just I just, I just, just wanted to get back to being more customer-centered. And we have the technology that allows people to, you know, deliver more value for their customers versus worrying about infrastructure. And like, I feel the best way to get there is standardization around how data is stored, how data is transported, uh, and we just require better, uh, uh, you know, uh, integrations and things like that, right? Like it shouldn't take a Herculean effort for me to like get data into Kafka and get data out of it. All right. Like, you know, if, if regardless of my persona, I should have a, a, a pretty well-established pathway to help me provide value for my customers. And right now it's still kind of like in that, you know, that, that Highlander phase, like, you know, we're trying to figure out who's going to win out. Right. Um, and that, in 10 years, I just hope it's just not that, right? And I just hope people are de delivering apps and experiences for their customers that, that actually resonate. This has been one of the, if the not if not the most fun episode to record so far. So thanks so much for uh, uh -huh. Thank bringing you for having me. Where can people find more about you or about Maroxa? Uh, Maroxa.com, about the company. We're on Twitter as Maroxa Data. And uh, I'm always talking crap on Devaris P. Brown on Twitter as well. So you can find Amazing. me there. I'm always there. I'm always here to help. Just don't give him your address because he'll show up there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to seem like, like, I don't know, man. I was just, I feel He's like. a friendly guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm super friendly. But like, you know, I'm, I'm still like this analog person in this digital times, you know? Yeah. And, awesome. I, and it's, it's so weird as a tech CEO to say that. But like, you know, it is what it is. So. Thanks so much for coming on. No, nah, thank you for having me. And it was a real pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Likewise. The Analytics Engineering Podcast is sponsored by DBT Labs and is hosted by Tristan Handy and myself, Julia Schottenstein. Have comments, questions, or guest suggestions? Email us at podcast at dbtlabs.com. Our producers are Jeff Fox and David Krevitt. If you enjoy the show, please drop a review or share it with a friend. Thanks for listening.